One way to fix this issue is to improve and repair current irrigation. What this means is that the initial irrigation that was done in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s to take the water that was met for the arrow and give it to farmers wasn't done very well. It's estimated that up to 70% of the water that's diverted from the rivers is simply wasted. Some of that goes into the ground and others of it just evaporate into the sky. This is not a good system. For example, only 12% of the canals in Uzbekistan are resistant to water loss. That means that it's just seeping into the ground and going into the sky. If they were going to improve this though, they could cover some of the water, they could build channels that don't seep into the ground, and they could do other things. The pros of this, obviously, would, that, would be that much of this water could be saved. That means farmers and the government could return a lot of the water that they're taking right now to the Aral Sea. They could just let it continue down the river. But the problem is, this would be very expensive. They already have canals built, and it's hard to get farmers to want to build new ones when they don't really have a water problem. The other problem is that these rivers and these dams are going in multiple countries. That means that you're going to have to get multiple countries on the same page and agree to split the cost. How do you do that? Another alternative is to desalinate what water is left. As you've read about, most of the water is contaminated. Most of it is too salty for humans or animals. If we could make that water fresh again, even though it would only be 10% of what's left, it would be a good 10%. That desalination process, though, requires a lot of energy and a lot of high technology. The pros, obviously, would be that it makes the water healthy again for humans and animals and plants. This would return some of the jobs, but not all. The cons are that it's extremely expensive. The region where the Aral Sea is is not a well-to-do region, and many of the countries in the area are poor. With that said, can they afford it? Probably not. Another thing to consider is that desalinization requires a lot of energy. A lot of that might be in coal or gasoline or some other forms, but either way, that could be bad for the environment as well. So you might be asking yourself, what's more important, the air quality or the water quality? That's a decision that's very tough to make. It might surprise you to learn that right now, many of the farmers are not paying for the water they're using. The reason is because the government is providing the water for free, especially in Uzbekistan. They do this because they want to encourage farmers to keep farming. Imagine, if you had a drippy faucet in your house, would you let it drip all the time, or would you fix it to save yourself money? Obviously, you'd fix it. But right now, farmers in these countries are not paying anything for wasted water. So what's their incentive to stop wasting? Well, if they start charging, of course, the farmers don't want to pay for what they're not using. They would stop wasting. This would increase the amount of water that is available for the Aral Sea. It could also have a, another positive effect, as it would generate income. Governments could take this generated income and actually use it for restoration projects. This could help further build more dams and divert more water back into the Aral Sea. The con is that with fees, some farmers probably might just say, Hey, it's not worth it. I can't farm anymore. Imagine, you have something free and all of a sudden you start paying for it. You know where that money comes from is your profit. So many farmers would probably quit, and Uzbekistan does not want to lose that income. One controversial way of fixing the problem that many have proposed is to use hybrid and drought-resistant crops. There are many varieties of cotton. Some require less water than others. Additionally, scientists have created alternative types that require very little. These kind of crops are called genetically modified. So, you might ask yourself, if there are natural crops and ones that scientists have created that are still going to produce cotton, but with a lot less water, why don't people use it? I mean, the pro is that, hey, you will save that water. We don't need to divert the waters if we use those. But, as I said, this is controversial. 
One reason is that other varieties of this kind of crop, and especially the ones created by scientists, tend to be more expensive for farmers to purchase. Plus, they're already all set up for the kind of cotton plants they have now, so they'd have to change all their equipment. Another issue that makes it very controversial is that some people do not like scientifically created crops. They say they're not natural, and they might not be as safe. So, how are we going to convince these people to change? One solution that a lot of outsiders point to is that they're growing the wrong kind of crops. If cotton and other water-hungry crops don't like growing in the desert, then don't grow them there. There are many crops that do grow in a desert. Why can't the farmers just grow those? Think about it. If you have desert crops growing, you'll need no additional water on a regular basis. These plants will also be a lot easier to care for. And one final thing is that salinization in the desert would stop. The reason salt keeps building up on the land is because they're dumping this water on it over and over and over again. The water dries up, leaves the salt behind. If we're not putting the water there, we're not putting the salt there either. The big con, though, that people in the region would tell you is that they don't want to grow those kind of crops because of one simple reason. Money. Cotton is worth a lot of money, and that's why they grow it. They don't grow it because they love cotton. They grow it because they love making money. Now, how are you going to ask a farmer right now who's doing well for himself to stop growing cotton and start growing something that's not going to have him do as well for himself? It just doesn't make sense to them. One solution that's already been tested and put into practice is actually to build more dams. In the north, they have seen actually some returning of water to the northern Aral Sea. They could dam up more rivers in those countries and others to divert water back into the Aral Sea. Some have estimated that in just 20 to 30 years if this was done, the Aral Sea would actually return to its former size. That's just a matter of decades. All this water returning would create a big boom in health for the region. This means air quality, this means land quality, and this means water quality. That would improve the health of people, plants, and animals. As I said, this could be done in 20 to 30 years, but it would cost 30 to 50 billion dollars. Going back to our earlier discussion, these are not countries that are well to do. This means that there's going to have to be a lot of countries working together. And some countries are more helpful and some are less helpful. For instance, Uzbekistan is not very willing to give up waters. If they give up the water, they will lose their cotton. Building off that, it becomes obvious that it's going to take an international effort to reform the Aral Sea to its former form. If it's ever going to get back to where it was, a lot of countries are going to have to get involved. Even some countries that are not from that area. One group that has already gotten involved is the World Bank. As we discussed, the northern Aral region has built some new dams. Well, much of that money has been a loan from the World Bank. The pros of this idea are that if more countries are helping out, then each country will face a smaller financial burden, meaning they'll have to spend less money. It could also create a sense of shared responsibility for the sea. Had that sense existed in the 1960s, maybe this would have never happened. The con, again, is that not everybody is willing to help. How do you get people to come together? This all brings us back to the question that we originally asked. How do we fix it? There's probably not one answer. It's probably a combination of the things. But one thing is for sure. There really needs to be an international effort, and people need to start working together, or else we'll never see the full return of the Aral Sea. So I guess it's up to you. What do you think will happen?